Hello, I am Rafiq Puttur, Senior Product Manager here at Juniper Network. Welcome to the Timing is Everything series. Today I am joined by my colleague Kamachi Gopalakrishnan. He is the Senior Distinguished Engineer and System Architect within the AVAN team. Today we are going to talk about network timing and why it is more important than ever. Kamachi, thanks a lot for joining today's session. If you look at today's dynamics, timing is everywhere. And as a company, we heavily invest on timing. And if you look at the current geopolitical scenario, timing plays a very, very crucial role, especially the network-based timing. Can you please explain why network-based timing has been so crucial in today's scenario? When it comes to network-based timing, I mean, when it comes to timing, first of all, to talk about, basically, you know, the primary source of timing, especially in the wireless communication, is GPS which is basically the GNSS, which is a global navigation satellite system. But the predominant satellite system, which is used for in most of the countries for source of the timing is GPS. So, but in war zone area today, the conflict area, if you really look at it, the first thing is getting impacted is the GPS. So either by spoofing or jamming, right? When the GPS is brought down, it's pretty much really like you know, your wireless communication you know, is disrupted. And this is not really just for um, you know, the commercial wireless network, but also for you know, uh, things like you know, uh, government and military operations too. And uh, so that's where really like there is always a need for you know, uh, alternate way to uh, support the synchronization in the network, and that's where the network-based synchronization plays a critical role. But if you look at today, right, it is not just about the 4G or the 5G. There are so many applications that are emerging. Right. So can you please quickly explain what are these applications where they are required this kind of critical timing application? Timing. That's right. Like, you know, 4G and 5G is one of the area where timing and synchronization is very critical, but then there are other verticals. As our company, really, like, you know, we are heavily into, apart from 4G and 5G and mobile backhaul applications, we are also involved in uh, financial services industry, where basically, like, the ESMA and the SEC standard bodies are all mandate, mandating, like, really how you know, accurate the time uh, synchronization is, and which basically they are trying to use for um, time stamping the financial records, like a transaction records, right? And uh, whether it's for auditing or even for really high frequency trading point of view, uh, it's very critical the synchronization is. And then the other vertical, if you really look at it, it's a you know, professional video broadcast network. In professional video broadcast network, um, traditionally, it used to be SDI technology. And then that basically, when the migration happened from SDI to Ethernet, then they need a synchronization uh, through the Ethernet technology. And that's where, again, network-based synchronization played a critical, which is you know, predominantly, we are talking about precision timing protocol, which is yeah. PTP. Then also the cable vertical, right? When DOCSIS over Ethernet migration happened, so we need really synchronization between the CMTS and the RPD devices, right? Yeah. And that is actually achieved by you know, uh, network-based synchronization, which is again PTP these days. If you look at today, it's all about the mobile backhaul, the cable, the FSI, all the media company. But you know, there's a lot of new areas are coming. That's the right. ALML era, right. then the, all the automated, uh, the fully automated vehicle, the space right. exploration. Right. But as an industry expert, as a subject matter expert, what do you envision? What are the areas? What are the new applications going right. to play the critical role with this, with respect to this timing? The what we talked about, this four verticals, really like you know, it's a huge already. But then there are so many other verticals are evolving or. I would say not even evolving, like, you know, already really looking for high precise synchronization. Yeah. Uh, one is the data center, right, where really like, you know, the access of the database from different systems need to be, you know, precise. If it is, the more the precise, you know, the synchronized it is, it's really like, you know, more efficient way you can access the database, whether for read or write operation and stuff like that. And then, of course, as you said, really like, you know, um, in fact, as a company, we worked with uh, you know, a rocket launching 
um, okay. you know, customers really. Like it's playing a very critical role, um, synchronizing between the, the launch vehicle and the really like, you know, the ground station. Yeah. They need a high precise synchronization. And then when it comes to autonomous vehicle system, yes, I mean the self-driving cars and stuff, they really need very high precise uh, synchronization. Um, and then the E911, which basically mandates uh, locating like, you know, a subscriber, which is a cell phone. Yeah you know, in a precise of like, you know, less than 10 meter or 100 meter kind of thing, which puts really like, you know, enormous onus on, um, you know, the precise synchronization, right? I mean, again, the other aspect which you talked about or you asked about, um, which is basically like, you know, on the AA and the ML point of view, right? So we might have seen like quite a few, uh, you know, uh, already yeah. talks from Juniper, like, yeah. you know, uh, from Sharda and uh, Bob Friday, about really like, you know, network for AI, yeah. right? And so today, you know, if you have a precise synchronization between these different servers, and really like, you know, it will be more efficient when they are completing the job and then really unifying the job and then going for the next level of processing and stuff. So it's really like, you know, through that, the synchronization, uh, especially the time synchronization, whether it's a phase or frequency or the time, it's getting more and more critical in every part of the life or every part of applications, okay. right? Whether you take an internet of things or a smart grid application or AML or really like, you know, uh, financial, anything, okay. you name it. I understand that as a subject expert or SME, you can talk all of those things, right? But you know, what are the technology involved in this thing from the timing point of view, right? Can you please talk about that? So when, when it comes to network-based synchronization, um, the first thing people, you know, think about it is NTP, network time protocol. I mean, NTP is not bad at all, but then the idea is that we are talking about here precision in the order of nanoseconds, you know, tens of nanosecond. Yeah. So, which basically NTP is not there yet, yeah. right? Um, then the other technologies, if you look at it, uh, Sonnet SDH and synchronous ethernet, these are all like a physical layer clocking technology, which is good, uh, in the sense that they can achieve only frequency synchronization. But if you need a time or phase, you cannot get it, mm -hmm. right? Um, because TDD application, which is time division duplex, which needs a phase and phase synchronization. So just a frequency is not good enough. So yeah. if you have a FDD based, uh, you know, spectrum, then yes, you can really do with the, you know, frequency synchronization. So then the ultimately like, you know, what is that one network based protocol which can provide not only the high precision, but also can do frequency, phase, and time, that's nothing but, you know, kind of predominantly these days is a PTP, yeah. which is IEEE 1588 based protocol, which stands for precision time protocol, right? Um, so that is really the technology is getting adapted across, uh, you know, applications for high precise synchronization these days. But if you look at today's, our investment, we heavily invest on network-based timing as a right. Juniper, as a company. But you know, if you look at our customer base, there's a lot of customers successfully deployed their various use cases using our devices. That's right. But if you look at the all the evolution happening, the newer trends happening, why a customer coming to Juniper? Because you know, Juniper considers a leading vendor for a timing solution. Right. So can I quickly walk through why you think yeah. Juniper has been the leading vendor and what are the devices are used in these kind of deployments? One thing, the value proposition that Juniper gives, it's really like, you know, huge, I would say, really. I mean, not just for the sake of like, you know, uh, what we are doing, uh, because when it comes to precision, right, we are talking about class C, class D, which is 10, 5 nanosecond precision, and then we are talking about the, yeah. the full chassis, like our MX10K yeah. or PTX10K platforms, or even starting from small cell side router, like a ACX series, or really like, you know, um, you know uh, big boxes, like, you know, what I talked about, PTX, uh, 10K or something. We are talking about, we are trying to meet the same 10 nanosecond or 5 nanosecond precision, right? Yeah. I mean, the worst case, in the early generation, we did 20 nanosecond, which is class B, yeah. but then now we are moving more and more towards 10 and 5, and that's not something happens like, you know, in a trivial way, like, you know, it's not like a fluke, right? Yeah. So we have, like, you know, um, uh, lot of effort on the system design aspect yeah. of it. When we say system design, it's not just the software or hardware, but also our ASIC, right? And also how we design the overall system in order to meet that five or 10 nanosecond precision, yeah. right? 
So um, when you talk about hardware, really, like you know, we use a high stratum three E OCXOs, right? And then we use really like very advanced EEC PLLs, which is typically used for um, the jitter and wander cleanup for sinky point of view, but also for the entire distribution of the clock within the chassis, yeah. starting from your RCB, where the central timing card, and all the way to the FIS, which is you know in the line card, right? The yeah. egress point. But on top of it, we invest heavily on our ASICs, right? Yeah. So we, wherever we don't use FIs, we use ASIC to do the timestamping, right? And not only like, you know, our uh, advantage is just really meeting this performance and stuff, we really have microcodable engine, especially on Trio ASIC, if you look at it, which can do really a lot of magic, right? Yeah. We can work across the different FI timestamping FIs, and then really like, you know, we can encapsulate under whatever we want, right? Yeah, yeah. Whether PTP over IPv4, V6, or Ethernet, uh, whether one tag, two tag, or MPLS, one label, two label, three labels, or VXLAN, right? I mean, we are very flexible when it comes to trio AC, yeah. right? Um, so there is a lot of aspect in the hardware point of view. When it comes to software, unlike other vendors, right, we basically developed in-house both stack and servo, yeah. right? So, which gives a huge advantage. It's not only like, you know, we put in our brightest minds and algorithm into it, but then really like, you know, we have a very good handle on it. When there is an issue reported from the field or something, we know wh where the problem is, yeah. right? Unlike other vendors, they use their PLL vendors or their FPGA vendors solution or stack and servo, right? So which means like it takes time to really even, you know, triage the issues in the field. Yeah. So that's biggest advantage we have. Since we own the stack and servo and we have a reference design, so yeah. we use FPGA based architecture, right? So why the FPGA really gives you accelerated packet generation. So that's why really like, you know, our platforms typically support 512 clients, PTP yeah. clients, which is really like, you know, not you can expect every other vendor can able to support it, right? With the same precision, with the highest packet rate possible, 128 packets per second and stuff, yeah. right? And beyond all these things, you know, since we have a reference design, we have our stack and servo, we do everything in-house here, so we really like able to do across the platform, whether you take ACX or PTX or QFX or MX, our configuration commands, our operational commands, everything is really same, uniform, right? Yeah. So that gives a bigger advantage to the end user. Really, like, you know, he's not really, uh, whoever it is, he's not really, like, you know, struggling between, like, to pro provision ACX yeah. versus MX versus PTX differently. Yeah. If you look at, as a company, we heavily invest in network-based timing. There's a lot of customer successfully deployed, but, you know, customer requirement keep on increasing. There is a lot of standard body recommendation. Then also we have a yeah. lot of our own property of supporting. Yeah. But if you look at both of them, you being both part of both the side, how do you see how we are aligned to that standard bodies? Yeah, yeah the timing when it comes to really, uh, it's not like one standard. Like for example, unlike the other protocols when you take a routing or something, like for example, you know, it's IETF is predominantly defining whether OSPF or, you know, uh, other uh, routing protocols, right? But when it comes to timing, really like, you know, the idea is that different standard body is trying to do a different aspect of yeah. it, right? So IEEE 1588 is, is a kind of a mother spec, right? But then when ITUT really wo started working on from telecom point of view, which is, um, you know, from the wireless uh, mobile, mobile backhaul mobile. point of view, they basically like, you know, said, oh, as it is, the 1588 cannot be adopted, so we have to do really something called profiles. Yeah. So they started developing the profiles and then really like, you know, one for, you know, frequency profile, other for face profile, I like that, right? And then really like similarly when, it come, when you come to the professional video broadcast network, the SMPT is standard, right? So they really said, oh, we need to really modify what encapsulation to be used, what are the, uh, you know, clock selection algorithm supposed to be for my particular application, right? All these changes really happen. And again, financial side, IETF really took over that. So from Juniper point of view, yes, we really like, you know, we are focusing like the, the main vertical where we are, right? Uh, which is a financial, mobile backhaul, and uh, cable, and really like professional media broadcast network. So we are basically very closely aligned with the different standards which is going on. Uh, in fact, really from, uh, apart from all these things, lately like customer really having a pain on how to monitor and, you know, uh, 
provision the network and then monitor the network, right, for synchronization point of view. For that, the telemetry and end-to-end -end sync monitoring, these are all really getting very critical. So from Juniper point of view, uh, we are heavily into the ORAN standardization, uh, WG9 XOL transport network. So we are driving the synchronization architecture and solution. And then from IEEE point of view, we are closely involved. And ITUT standard body point of view, we are working closely. And then, of course, we are picking really which platform needs what and then which customer, okay. you know, it really like corners towards. Based on that, we are really like, you know, putting together things in Juniper side. Thanks a lot, Cam, for your insight. Thanks a lot, guys, for your time. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.